Manchester.co.za. T's and C's apply. Airing a radio commercial isn't cheap. So for me to tell you what the Axis People Wear payroll can do for you in 30 seconds is impossible. But here's what I can do. I can tell you what the Axis People Wear payroll can't do. It can't make coffee. Not yet. I've been told uh, we're working on that one. But that's about it, I think. For salaries, wages, payslips, and employee self-service, Axis People Wear, the everything for everyone payroll. Visit accsys.co.za. Something big has returned. The Epic Tire Sale. The world's leading tire brands at prices you can't ignore. With big brands you can trust and big value you can afford. The Epic Tire Sale. Only at Tiger Wheel and Tire. New store, Freiburg, ctwt.to for details. The, the big issue. Tonight's big issue, Michael Goldman from Gibbs. He's a senior lecturer at Gibbs in the world of sports marketing. And we thought he'd be the best guy to talk to us about why so many sporting federations seem to find themselves in greater and greater financial trouble. Athletic South Africa has got a huge debt. SAFA is bankrupt. South African Football Association. South African Hockey is struggling. I bet netball is struggling. I don't know what else is struggling. If you're in the world of sport, you've you got any questions in terms of sports uh, associations, why they're struggling. And I don't mean to uh, tread on Udo's turf here, but um, this is about the money of sport. O double one eight eight three zero seven zero two zero two one four four six zero five six seven. Why is it, Mr. Goldman, that sports uh, federations, I say sports teams, the sports teams are fine, sports federations are in trouble? Evening, Bruce. Yes, it, it is a bit worrying if you look across the the landscape and you see some of our major sports and their federations that uh, seem to be coming unstuck on a number of fronts around the management and the governance kind of issues reflecting at the end of the day in terms of cash flow uh, and that's why we're starting to see the reports in the newspapers that we have over the last week. Okay, so what is the health of South Africa Sport PTY Limited generally? Broad overview. I think the broad overview is good. I think we have a strong sports management sector. I think we have some great agencies. I think we have some strong rights holders in places uh, and previous athletes and managers of those rights holders, those federations, those teams uh, that I think have the interests of the athletes at heart. Uh, but that doesn't you know, necessarily go across the board. I think you have some great sponsors that are executing and activating around their sponsorships uh, that, that really put us uh, globally, very globally competitive. Uh, but I think what you've certainly seen within SAFA and Athletic South Africa of late uh, suggests some, some questionable uh, challenges around the, the financial performance, the management, and the governance issues. Uh, and so you can go back to the Nicholson inquiry with Cricket South Africa. I was going to say, cr exactly. cricket was exposed to have huge financial issues within it, not necessarily bankruptcy of cricket, but certainly massive issues around governance, massive issues around incentives. The management of cricket then was smelling like a, a, a nasty, rotting fish from the head downwards. Um, um, it fortunately didn't affect the performance of the players. Exactly, and what they're able to do on the field, as they did in the last uh, few days, again proves uh, the, the, the real uh, power of those athletes and how they're able to focus. But if you if you look at the key outcomes of the Nicholson inquiry and the political pressure that was that was put in place to, to facilitate that, you know, it really comes down to governance issues. It's about the size of the board. It's about the independence of those on the board. It's about the power of the board versus the management. Uh, and I think you can see across Athletic South Africa and SAFA at the moment similar kinds of, of issues that are being raised around the power of the board board versus management around the size and independence of that board. I mean, uh, SAFA, for example, you're looking at 36 people on that National Executive Committee. What? Sorry, just there are how many people on the National Executive Committee of 36. SAFA? That seems a little bit top heavy. Yeah, I mean, Nicholson suggested that 20 members of the CSA board was too many. Uh, and, and it suggested uh, in his findings that it was professionally unproductive and inefficient. Uh, and, and so incredibly lucrative for the people who are sitting on those boards. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, given a, that it's a membership-based association, and many of our sports in the country, we need to understand, are membership-based associations. Uh, that really does provide a lot of mass mobilization of, of people playing and participating in sports around the country all the time. And that's wonderful. Uh, one of the challenges of that is it creates very political organizations mm. uh, because, you know, it, it's about your power bases and it's about where in the country you represent. Uh, and, and that creates these large structures. Uh, and I think you, you certainly see that within some of these, these mass sports, such as football, 
football and athletics. But when you go look at the management of sport, I mean, for example, uh, if you look at SAFA being bankrupt, tensions among the executive committee members uh, ahead of the September elections, the politics of sport uh, is precisely what it becomes about. So at the management level, you've got people involved in the, of the highest degree. Exactly. And I think, you know, certainly upcoming elections and, and uh, kind of power and politics issues within those organizations uh, perhaps can be looked at as, as one of the reasons that we're seeing some of these things come out. Uh, and unfortunately, what happens is that the off the field stuff then starts attracting from the on the field stuff. Mm. You know, and managers of sport really need to be focused on the fans and their engagement with what happens on the field. The minute the fans that are talking about stuff off the field, we've already lost the plot. How, how does sport make money in simple terms? Okay, so if I am Cricket South Africa or I am Sascock or I am Safa, um, how would I, as an organization, as an umbrella body of all these membership organizations, actually make money? It comes from, ultimately, the ticket sales and, of course, the very lucrative world of sponsorship. Exactly. Three broad areas that drive most of the revenues uh, and, and far too much is, is being relied on uh, around media rights and around sponsorship. Uh, but, but, you know, those are not the only ones. As you mentioned, around uh, ticket sales and merchandise and selling things at games, selling things to fans. Uh, it's really underpinned by fans. What you really want to build is a strong fan base that's uh, enjoying a competitive performance on the field, uh, that's having a wonderful experience following their team. When you have that, you then have something that's marketable, uh, whether it's the athletes, it's the team, it's the tournament, it's the performance, and that's marketable then to, to sponsorship uh, organizations companies, etc., uh, brands, as well as media rights. But I think one of the key things we've seen over the last while in some of those negotiations is a recognition that those rights are not automatic, that, that rights holders and, and federations cannot just expect that people will buy their sponsorship rights and their media rights if they don't have something of value that they're selling. And also, in the world of South Africa, the, the media rights, the broadcast rights of these things, there isn't all that much competition. Either Supersport is going to air something, or the SABC is going to air something. And there isn't much in between. Well, certainly in South Africa, it is dominated. I mean, across Africa, a little bit more uh, opportunity for some competition, perhaps from some of the Chinese operators, um, Al Jazeera, etc. And so there's increasing competition in Africa, and Supersport, for example, are very focused at that. Uh, but certainly, if you're a rights holder of federation in South Africa, you really have two options. And you need to think about the balance between those two options, because you really want to be on free-to-air, because that really drives the numbers, and it puts you in contact with your fans. Um, you know, the Supersport perhaps might do some wonderful production but it's not necessarily hitting the, the strongest numbers uh, across the country and, and so rights holders need to think about that balance between uh, the subscription and the free to air. The economics of putting rugby on super sport for example are very different to the economics of putting um, local football, the PSL, onto, onto super sport for argument's sake. Well absolutely, I mean I think the PSL deal that super sport did a number of years ago was exceptionally useful for them uh, as they... Oh, sorry, useful for super sport or for PSL? I think for both. <laughs> it, was, it was a wonderful partnership because it really allowed both to benefit from the capabilities of the other and the access of the other. It, it was great for the PSL uh, in, in terms of games uh, and, and the coverage and the professionalism of the production, etc. But at the same time, uh, it, it was fabulous for Supersport in terms of the kind of access it gave them to a market uh, for their compact uh, decoders. Uh, and so that's the kind of partnership you want to see where it's really driven by commercial interest. Uh, and, and increasingly, I think that's the kind of partnership we want to see negotiated. Is commercial interest always in the interests of the fans, however, because the fans, um, many of the fans can't afford the, the DSTV compact decoder uh, and therefore may feel a little bit put out that their favorite team is now um, playing on a channel that they can't access. They might have to go to a tavern that's got a decoder to go and watch it. That brings a new dynamic into the game. But then it has an impact on merchandising and ultimately that fan sport, doesn't it? Absolutely. I mean, in a country like South Africa, you need to be on free-to-air and you need to balance that, that subscription coverage uh, on a super sport with uh, the, the coverage on free to air and I think that's critical for any rights holder uh, that's looking to build strong fan bases because you're not going to be able to sell those media rights and those sponsorship rights and the licensing deals and the merchandising etc 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 you're not going to be able to fill stadiums if you're not reaching the majority of our people when, was, when did sport really become merchandisable in South Africa in the 
golden days. There was a game of rugby on a Saturday afternoon. There were a couple of games of soccer. There was a test match happening somewhere at four o'clock in the morning in New Zealand that you might tune your black and white television into in the 1970s to watch mm. um, if, in fact, there were, you know, if that sort of sport was going on. Um, when, when did sport become big money in this country? Well, I think certainly the, 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 you know, the, the role that super sport played, I think, is really critical uh, over the last decade or more around that. Uh, I think also if you look within the different sports and you see what, what super rugby has done to the commercialization of rugby in South Africa and what the Sharks have done uh, really over the last uh, decade or two. No, but why the Sharks? Because the Sharks have become the ultimate South African rugby franchise. If you speak to anybody about, this, about super rugby, um, they're most like Sharks. It's cool, it's funky, it is uh, the brand.